Today's scriptures take us to a time when Jerusalem had been destroyed, and the people of that time were in exile. And the prophet writes that the news that God had called them to was to restore them and uh, reunite them together. We are reminded that God's salvation is to reach to the end of the earth. That God's purpose is wider and greater than what our expectation may be. That God's love and grace always extends beyond the limits that we try to impose. And it is easy for us as a congregation or as an individual to forget that call. This brings me to a story I'd like to share of a mission trip that I took not long after I left here, the first year that I was at Countryside, back in 2009. And the mission trips at Countryside were a little bit different at that time than what we were used to. The mission trips that we took here were usually to Kansas City or an area close by. At that time, their history was to go further away to Chicago or New York or those types of places. <clears throat> and being a new youth uh, director at the time, they asked me, do you feel comfortable going somewhere like Chicago? And out loud, I said, sure, I can go to Chicago. That's not a problem at all. Inside, I was thinking of the trips that Tina and I took to the inner city of Kansas City and how my heart would kind of jump a little as we would go through town and have people walk by the cars. But I kept thinking, I can do this. God will keep us safe wherever we go. And I'm not about to tell them that inside there was a little bit of fear of being in downtown Chicago. So I spent the semester looking for places that we can go. And with mission trips, you have two choices. You can kind of go the cookie cutter route, which is where you go and these groups and organizations do things for you. <coughs> and you just kind of participate with the kids, or you can go kind of the hard way, which is to put the trip together yourself. Well, I was trying to prove myself, so I decided that we put the trip together to ourselves. Keeping in mind that I have never, ever, ever been to Chicago. Kansas City was probably the biggest city, inner city that I had stayed in um, by myself. So we go, we planned this trip by phone and we're told I got to see a little bit of pictures of what it was going to be like and we truly were staying in the inner city. In fact, we the lodging was a church, which was a Spanish speaking congregation, who, um, right next to a homeless shelter. <clears throat> and the kids were really excited and I was really excited. Well, our first day there, First of all, I'd like to say I'm very proud of myself because that was the first time that I had been in inner city Chicago with a 15 passenger van and my first experience of parallel parking something bigger than my grand aunt at the time. And as you can imagine, the interesting funny thing when we got there, the man that helped us, his name was Herbert, he said, don't worry. If you hit a car, that's what bumpers are for in Chicago. <laughs> I was raised by my father who taught me that you do not touch the sides of the cars. My father is a man that when he goes to a parking lot, if he's next to a car, he comes out afterwards and checks for dings. So I was a little nervous thinking that we were renting a van that wasn't ours and that they used bumpers as real true bumpers in Chicago. But I am proud to say I did not hit the bumpers on either side of that car. I was very proud of myself. I don't think my husband believed me, but I did. <laughs> so we get there, and our first day, we, just, we are staying in this church. And our first day was actual worship within the church. And the church was hospitable enough that they provided earphones for us. And they had students, high school students, that would translate from Spanish to English for us, which was really, really fun and um, interesting that we could take in the word. And again, this was a area that was mostly Spanish-speaking people. Interestingly enough, it was a nice little moment of what it's like to also be among youth, because these youth were not used to actually having people that were listening to their sermon or they're listening to their interpretation. And so they would start telling whatever the pastor was saying, and then pretty soon you could hear, oh, 
blah, 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 and they'd start talking. So it was kind of fun to see that they were being real in that moment. So we did this service, and we sat through this service, and then we were told of what we were going to be doing for the next few days. One of the things that we were going to be doing is to going door to door for the police department. And at the time we weren't thinking this was something really big of a deal, but they were kind of having a night out with police, kind of the neighborhood watch things that we have here. The difference was we were to put information about this event on cars, but we were also warned that the neighborhood we were going to be in was there was lots of gang activity and lots of gang members that live in that neighborhood. So if you can imagine the uncomfortable feeling we got realizing that we were going to put information on having a party with the police on cars of people that were gang members. We were told to be careful but to do this. And I have to admit, at first I was thinking, how can we get around this without, you know, actually doing it? But again, the voice told me, have faith in God and do as we're told. The next morning, a man by the name of Stan greeted us. Stan was six foot two, a very big guy, bald, and kind of scary looking, I'm not going to lie. He even admitted to that. And he was very grumpy, extremely grumpy. And we quickly found out that Stan was going to be the man that showed us our entire week. He was going to give us our projects and give us our things to do. He was the one in charge of Although we had the head person that planned everything, he was the guru. He was the one that knew every part of that ministry. And I don't think Stan liked me because at the beginning, because I was very cheery and happy, and I would say good morning, and he'd say, ah, whatever. You're just trying to be nice because you're a Christian. And I would just kind of pretend I didn't hear that and continue to be nice. Well, on the second day, so we had the first day, and it was kind of a rough day, but we did what he said, and I was trying to figure out what we could do to bridge this gap. The second day, Stan brought me coffee, and I didn't realize he was bringing me coffee. He had four or five coffees in his possession, and I had known that Stan did not have much money, and I had seen that he had coffee, and he said, oh, here, would you like some coffee or something? And I said, oh, no, thank you, Stan, I appreciate that. And he turned around and he said some words I probably can't say. And he's like, well, I brought you coffee and you're not even going to be nice enough to take it. Nice Christian. Well, I realized at that moment that Stan was taking a moment to reach out to me. In the only way that he knew. And although it was gruff, it was an invitation into being in relationship with him. So I took that coffee and I drank it. I don't drink coffee without coffee without creamer and sugar, but I will tell you, that was the strongest coffee I've ever had in my entire life. And I drank every last bit of it. I was almost afraid what would happen if I didn't drink it, and I didn't want to offend it any more than I already had. So I drank the coffee. But during our time sitting there, Stan started to open up to me. He started to share with me and with the youth a little bit of his story. He had actually been in prison 12, 15 years before, 15 to 20 years before then. He had went to prison for aggravated attempted robbery and attempted murder. <clears throat> I don't even know what my face looked like when he said attempted murder. But I remember looking around at the youth and saying to myself, please don't call your parents until the end of today. <laughs> so that we can smooth this over and make it sound just a little better than it had started off saying. But during that time, he shared with us his story of what it was like to be a child who at the age of 10 was turned out of his home and into the streets. He talked about how he had had to steal to find food and how unlikely things that had happened had helped with this life that he had um, went to. He did believe in God as a child. <clears throat> and it was in this place that helped him, while he was in prison, find God again. But what I got to think 
thinking about this later was, it would have been very easy for me to close my ears and my mind and my heart at that moment. The moment looking at this man who did look kind of scary, who was kind of gruff, who didn't seem very pleasant. Yet his story opened my heart and my mind to the reality that sometimes we say, love thy neighbor, but do we know who is my neighbor? Just last week, the youth at the youth house, we did an exercise, and I had them do, I told them that we were going to do a get to know you exercise. And during this exercise, I wanted them to share a scar that they had and the story behind it. Before I said we're going to do a get to know you exercise, they all started grumbling and saying, oh, Stephanie, we don't want to play this game. We know everything about each other. We're here together every single week. We talk to each other, we see each other at school, we know everything about each other. But quickly, just as I expected, as we're going around the room, some of the stories were pretty traumatic, some of them were pretty funny, and we started realizing that we don't know everything about one another. We started realizing that not only do people have stories that they have never shared, they have things about them that make them who they are that we really do need to share. Then I challenged them and I asked them, how well do all of you know your neighbors? And I ask you, the congregation, how well do you know the people that live around you? And at first you may say, oh, we know them. We see them every day or we talk to them at the mailbox. But how well do you really know your neighbor? For our youth, when we asked them if they knew the people right next to them, over half of the room said they didn't even know them very well. One person said that the only time they've ever seen their neighbor is when they come outside to mow the lawn. Another person said the only time they've seen their neighbor is at the annual garage sale. Thank goodness for that garage sale. <clears throat> we are invited to remember that God has called each of us to be in community. In 1 Corinthians, Paul reminds us that we are complicated. We are sticky and we are messy. Though God may be this infinite person who is perfect, we down here on earth tend to get complicated. Whether it be inside the church doors or at work or out on the streets, we have feelings and personal things that we are passionate about that sometimes bring us together, but other times divide us. However, God works through complicated people to take salvation to the ends of the earth. You see, you may not feel that God has called each and every one of you, but 1 Corinthians talks about our spiritual gifts. And this is another point that sometimes I think we make a small deal about. For this week, when at the youth group, I asked the youth to go around the room and ask them what they were good at. And believe it or not, they had a really hard time answering that. We would go around, and I, some of them would say pass, and there was 18 of us on Wednesday evening. And halfway around the room, they would say pass, pass, I don't know what I'm good at. But then pretty soon, someone next to them would be like, oh yeah, you are good at drawing. Or you're good at talking. Or you're good at never stop talking. And they'd go around the room, and when I asked them why it was so hard for them, they said, well, but Stephanie, we don't want to seem boastful. We don't want to, you know, that seems kind of cocky to say, I am really good at this. But I invite you, just as I invited them, to think about it differently. <coughs> To think about those God-given talents that God has given you. And to spin it in a way to use those spiritual gifts to help other people. For those that like to talk, maybe it's preaching. Maybe it's reaching out to someone that's visiting our church for the first time. For those that don't like to talk and like to be behind the scenes, Maybe it's sending that note to that person that visited our church for the first or second time. 
or that person that we've learned in worship or out on the streets that is dealing with an illness or a death in the family. I think about the power of being in Philadelphia, being away from my church home and church family, and feeling very alone as I sat on bed rest for four months. But there was this lady who, thanks to Pastor Janet calling Philadelphia and making sure that I had a connection to a church family while I was away, there was this one church that we were told about while we were there. And this lady was named Nadia. And Nadia had been approached by her pastor while we were there, and all she was told was, there's this family in Camden, New Jersey, which Camden is known as the most dangerous city in America, even above Detroit, by percentage. And they are looking for a church place, a, a place to go to church while they're away, while they wait for the arrival of their baby. Will you go and take them to church? She didn't know me, or Gerald. She didn't know if we were safe. She didn't know if it was a good idea to go to Camden. In fact, she shared that her mother would call. She was in her 40s, but her elderly mother would call before she left and as she got home to make sure she made it home from Camden. But she used those gifts that God had given her, her kind spirit that opened her heart and knew to be hospitable. And she drove us to church every single Sunday. There were days that I would have bad days and I was supposed to call her the night before letting her know if I wanted to go to church. And a few of those times I would be feeling kind of down in the dumps and I wouldn't call her because I didn't really want to go to church. And she would call and she would say, I just got the feeling I needed to call you and I felt like maybe you needed to be in church. And of course I couldn't say no to her. So we would go to church. God uses those moments to, to help people on this earth. When asked recently, where do you see God in the midst of so much pain, in the midst of so many things going wrong, I would invite you and remind you that God's face shines in the people that we pass every single day. The face of God may be the person that visits the sick person in the hospital. It may be the person that pulls over to help the person who has a flat tire. It may be the person who opens their heart and their doors and their minds. You are not lacking in any spiritual gift that God has given you. I invite you to extend the love and grace to all those around you, whatever those be. We are gifted and we are so blessed in this congregation to have so many that do so much for other people. But we are also to be reminded to go beyond this church, beyond this community, beyond this country, to love people and to be there wherever they are. As Pastor Janet taught this morning, we are to live by the golden rule, to treat others as we would want to be treated. And each of us know that deep down, we want people to love and to accept us for who we are. Who is your neighbor? How is your neighbor like you? I invite each of you, as we leave today, to be a light into the nation, spreading grace and love to all just as we are called to do. To be confident that as messy as we may be and as not capable as we may feel, that God chose you just as you are with the gifts, the skills, and the lack thereof to reach people and to continue to disciple to the ends of the earth. May we be that and do those things. Amen.